All right, well, good evening. So grateful that you guys could uh, join us tonight for Bible study. Um, I do have teaching notes available for you, so if anybody would like teaching notes and you don't have them, raise your hand, and uh, Donnie will get them for you. Anybody want teaching notes? Just raise your hand up. You'll get them. All right. Looks like everybody's good to go. Um, before we get into our teaching tonight, we are going to look at the bulletin, a few things I want to draw your attention to. Um, happening this week. Of course, tomorrow, Pastor Sam is teaching 2 Timothy. Uh, Children of God is going to be excellent. He's going through Leviticus on Wednesday nights as well. We have the high school worship night Thursday. Um, iron sharpens iron. That is for graduates who've gone through the God's Man's Boot Camp. I just call it GMBC for short. It's a lot easier. Lots of apostrophes there. But um, it's an excellent discipleship program. In fact, um, they just had their graduation this past Thursday. Uh, we were able to go to it, and it was just so awesome. This whole stage was filled up with guys and hearing testimonies. So if you have not gone through uh, that, that boot camp, that discipleship series, and you're a man and you'd like to do it, um, man, put it on your calendar. Next time it's going to be happening, I'm sure it'll be happening again this year. Um, that's something I really highly encourage. Um, so the Iron Sharpens Iron is kind of a continuation of that fellowship, and it happens on the first and third. Um, that says Tuesdays here. That should be Thursday, right? So, um, yeah, first and third Thursday at um, Calvary Chapel. All right, there's a Friday, mornings, a Friday morning men's Bible study as well that takes place. The men's fellowship dinner is happening March 17th, this Friday. It's going to be here, $10. And Pastor Sam's going to be sharing the word. It's going to be most excellent. So, uh, men, if you'd like to uh, participate, $10. You can pay at the door. And I believe Donnie has tickets tonight. So if you uh, want a ticket, talk with Donnie. And uh, that'll be great. Um, all right, lots of other great things um, coming soon. That's on your right-hand side. Uh, there's a high school car wash fundraiser that's going to be taking place um, to help raise funds for the, um, uh, what is it for exactly? It's for camp. camp. For camp, of course. What am I thinking? Uh, it's for camp. So um, that's happening. When is camp taking place? June 12th to the 15th. June 12th to the 15th. All right. Is that, yeah, there it is. Okay, cool. It's in here. Um, so high schoolers are doing their uh, fundraiser March 19th. The um, middle school is also doing a fundraiser. Uh, Pastor Daniel is organizing a, uh, a cook-off, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so all the details are here. If you like to cook, you can enter in, you know, your prize dish. And, uh, you know, if you'd like to eat, you're, you're, you're not so much one who cooks, but you like to eat, you can come, uh, pay $10 and sample all the delicious um, dishes that are going to be there. So um, that's what Daniel is organizing. All the information you can find on the website. That's going to be March 24th at 6 p.m. here at the church. What else? Uh, Pilot Lake, want to make sure you guys get that on your calendar. That's for the all-church family camp. It's going to be fantastic. Um, middle school, summer camp. All right. Lots of good things to, to be putting on your calendar and praying over. But now we are going to get into God's Word. So if you haven't already, open up your Bible to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. Father, we just, again, pause and acknowledge that your word is life. It is light. It is food to our soul. It is drink to, to our thirsty spirits, Lord. We need you so desperately. And so again, open up our eyes that we might see wonderful things from your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we looked last week at the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that genealogy started in Abraham, and Matthew drew a direct line from Abraham right to Jesus Christ. And we noted that the reason he did that was to identify who Jesus was, to show very clearly, hey, we have found the Messiah. We have his identity. 
Uh, this genealogy acted as like an identification card, if you will, for ancient people. And so it was very, very important to the Jews and very important to us because it also showed that God keeps his promises. He gave promises to Abraham. He gave promises to David that the Messiah would come through their line. And lo and behold, the Messiah has come and he is a descendant of these men. So it's very, very important for us. We took a, a Good look at that last study. And now Matthew continues on to show that Jesus is the Messiah, not just from his genealogy, but next he moves to his birth. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And Jesus' birth was miraculous. There was miraculous births, of course, throughout the Old Testament. Um, probably the most well-known is Abraham and Sarah having Isaac uh, Abraham, 100 years old, uh, Sarah is 90 when Jesus, not Jesus, excuse me, when Isaac is born. Miraculous indeed, uh, incredible. That's why Isaac was named Laughter. <laughs> you know, when Sarah heard of it, she laughed. When people heard about it, they, they just laughed with joy. How could it be? But this is, is far more than just, you know, a geriatric uh, pregnancy, is, I guess that's what they call it after, you know, you're 40 or something like that. They call it a geriatric pregnancy. It's kind of funny. Um, but uh, no, this is a, a virgin conception. That's what Matthew is going to teach us tonight. That's what he's going to reveal in his gospel, that, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Mary conceived in her womb, and this was of the Holy Spirit, and therefore he is fulfilling the prophecy that this would take place, as we find uh, in Isaiah 7:14, Jesus is the Messiah, not just because of his genealogy, but because of his birth. And these are things that you cannot control. You can't control who your ancestors are. You can't control how your birth is going to go down. But God, in his infinite sovereignty and wisdom, he, he laid it all out. The one who knows the beginning to the end he ordained it so. He ordained the, the, the genealogy of the Messiah. He ordained the birth of his son, Jesus. And so we, we look at it tonight. And we'll start in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Matthew very succinctly, yet, yet each phrase, each word here is very, very important. He just lays it out very succinctly, very beautifully. This is how it all came down. First, let's take a look here at this word betrothed. This is now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Now, betrothal, it's not a concept that most of us are familiar with. Here in our society, in our context, you want to get married to somebody, uh, they, you first ask them, right, and they become your fiancé. And um, then that moves on to marriage. And of course, if during that period where you're engaged, you know, things don't seem to be working out, well, Hopefully, the gal gives you the ring back and, you know, that, that's it, right? Um, you can break off an engagement pretty easily. But in ancient times, when you were betrothed, uh, this was much more serious. There was a real, there was a covenant involved with betrothal. There was an agreement. They were essentially married. In fact, in this text, uh, verse 19, take a look at what it says. Then Joseph, her husband right? The text says that Joseph is her husband at this point. Now, they were essentially married in all ways, except they didn't live together. They didn't have a sexual intercourse. But otherwise, they were knit together. And there was just, they were just waiting for a, a period of time, for about a year, before the marriage was consummated and finalized. Okay, so um, by the way, if you know, either party committed adultery during this time of, of uh, betrothal. It was considered not just fornication, but, but actually cheating on your spouse, and it could be punished as such. So betrothal was a, a very serious thing, 
And so Joseph and Mary are betrothed. But notice Matthew is very careful to say that they had not come together. So they were betrothed, but they hadn't come together, which is a, a euphemism, the Bible's way of saying they hadn't had sexual relationship yet, okay? So here's this couple, betrothed, and yet she is found with child. Now that word found is important. What the, the picture that it paints is this, that Mary... She was told by the angel, you know, and we'll look at that passage in just a moment there in Luke. She's told, you know, she's going to give birth to the Messiah and that the, the Spirit of God is going to overshadow her and so forth. But she did not share all of that. She conceives within her womb and the child grows. And it's not until she begins to show that people realize what's taken place. Okay, so she's found, and, and this would mean that Joseph was shocked. He was surprised at, at finding this, as, as rightly he should be, right? Mary was a virtuous woman. There was no reason for him to think that she would be unfaithful to him. And so to find that she was with child, he felt betrayed. He was shocked. He couldn't believe it, right? And so um, that's, that's the picture that we have here. But I also want to take a look, notice again, um, that she is found with child of the Holy Spirit. This is, as I mentioned in our introduction, a miraculous conception. This is what the Bible teaches. Never before had a virgin conceived a child. And this would be a clear sign to everybody that this child had a supernatural origin. Right? That there was something going on here that could only be explained by the hand of God. Right? That is why all of this is set up the way it is. Now, I want to take a moment, and I've written it out for you in your notes, the passage in Luke. I wanted to read this because this kind of gives a little bit more detail about the interaction that Mary had uh, with the angel and how you know, she conceived within her womb. So read with me in your notes, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled saying, and at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man, since I'm a virgin, in other words. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. A beautiful passage, much we could talk about and explore there, but I just wanted to read it to you because uh, of, of how it relates to our passage here tonight. So we see there at the end of that passage in Luke that, that Mary has submitted herself to the will of God. Just whatever you want, Lord, my life is yours. That's how she approached all of this. So 
Now, even though that was the case, and even though she had surrendered all of her life to God, and, and this, she conceives in her womb, as I mentioned before, she did not tell Joseph. So verse 19, Joseph discovers this, and we see then his response here in verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was a righteous man, he was an equitable man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So what is Joseph's initial response as he hears about this, you know, angelic visitation and Mary's claim that this is a, uh, you know, conception by the Holy Spirit? It's unbelief. And uh, that's a natural response, okay? It's an understandable response. Joseph says, how can this be? This just cannot be the case. And so he's pondering about this. He's thinking about it. And um, he's thinking, you know, I'll just do this thing quietly. I'm not going to make a public example of her, which would be to charge her with infidelity, to charge her with adultery, and potentially she could be stoned for that accusation. It's pretty serious. Joseph is, has no desire for that, and instead he's just going to quietly break off the betrothal, get a divorce, and move on with his life. So as he's considering these things, he's pondering these things within his heart, he drifts off to sleep. And while he is asleep, God intervenes. And thank God he does. <laughs> this is powerful. God, if ever a man needed divine, um, you know, a divine intervention, it was Joseph. Faced with just an overwhelming situation. And so God sends an angel, and this angel visits him. And notice how the angel addresses him in this dream. He, he first says, Joseph, son of David. Now, this is important because as we looked at last week, Joseph was of the line of David. He had a right to the throne of David. Joseph did. And therefore, if he is to adopt Jesus, as it were, to, to have Jesus be his son, Jesus would then be legally the heir to the throne of David, which has extremely important uh, consequences as it relates to the promises of the Messiah and such. So he calls him the son of David to remind Joseph of his kingly line. And then he says this, so important, and perhaps this is a word for someone here tonight, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Joseph was responding in his flesh. He was responding according to his own wisdom, according to what he thought was best. And essentially, he was afraid. He was afraid. If I take this woman to be my wife, the shame of her being an unwed woman and yet pregnant, all of that shame is going to then come upon me. And for the rest of my life, for the rest of my days, I am going to be sullied in the eyes of my community and the society at large. I'm going to be shunned. I'm going to be looked down upon. Certainly, these were some of the thoughts that were going through Joseph's mind. And, and again, his thought was, well, I'm just going to cut loose from her. She's going to have to deal with these consequences herself, and I'm going to remove myself from the situation. It was a response of fear. In fact, it's interesting because this word afraid in the Greek is phobos, of course, where we get phobia from, to have a phobia of something. And um, in classical Greek, it literally means to run away, to run away. So we've all experienced that fight or flight, you know, uh, reflex, maybe you get, you get scared, um, and 
you have a choice, and it's a choice that you generally you make instantaneously. Uh, you're either going to fight this thing off or you're going to run. I remember one time I was in the woods, and I used to run a lot. I was up way up in Megalia, um, running along the flume above De Sable, and it was kind of getting dusk, you know, evening time. And uh, as I'm running along, I hear a really loud rustle in the bushes, you know. And I thought immediately, what would you think? A bear or mountain lion, I was not going to stick around to find out, okay? And I took off. I, I, I'm sure I've had a PR of some kind, a personal record. Um, and, you know, so I, I ran and I ran and I ran. I just recently um, read a book called uh, 29 Days, and it's about a young man with uh, his companions. They were doing this river rafting trip. Um, through Canada, and uh, they were in this, uh, in this area that you're hundreds, literally hundreds of miles away from civilization. You're rafting on this trip, uh, you're out all by yourself with, with your companions, and it's just kind of up to you guys to, to get from point A to point B. They did have a satellite phone, thankfully, but, but they're out there kind of on their own. And on the 29th day, they're about... 10 days or so from their final destination, way, way up in the northern part of Canada. And this guy is out with his camera, and he is just taking pictures. He turns, he looks, and he sees a huge grizzly bear, right? And what was his response? He doesn't run, but he stays, and, and he tried to fight the bear off. He survived. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing story. Um, but I, I bring that up to say that you have these two responses, right? You're either going to fight this thing off or you're going to run. And Joseph, he's going to run. He's faced with this serious problem and his natural response is to run. But God comes to him and essentially says, do not run. Don't run. Don't try to run from your problems. Let that one sit for a little bit. We think, you know, if you know, you're faced with an issue, you're faced with a problem, and what do we want to do? We want to run. We want to escape. We want to try to be our own saviors. We want to try to rescue ourselves. But you know, those are the situations, those are the times that, you know, God has ordained that problem that seems so impossible, so insurmountable that I just want to run from, perhaps that's God's appointment for you to grow, to grow in faith, to trust him, to not depend upon your own reasoning, your own wisdom, your own understanding, but to surrender your life to him afresh and anew and to trust God in a new way. And sometimes situations are as such that you can't run. There's nothing you can do. But see, that's the, that's the crucible. That's the place where our faith is refined as fire. That's what Peter talks about in his first epistle. And therefore, our faith is going to be made like gold, refined in a furnace. The furnace, yes, of affliction, but God is at work. And so, don't run. Time and time again, God tells his people, do not fear. God's perfect love, what does it do to fear? Anybody know? It casts it out. God's perfect love casts out all fear. Now, what we are called to do as his children is to trust our Father. And that's essentially, again, what God is calling Joseph to do here. Trust me. Rather than fear, Joseph must trust God. See, fear is often what Satan wants to use to manipulate you, to get you to not trust God, to get you to take your life into your own hands. And generally, <laughs> we make really bad decisions. There's something that um, Sam has 
shared with me. And it, it, when I first came to Chico, Sam and I went for a long walk, and um, Pastor Sam, and one thing he said has stuck with me for a long time. He says, when I first came to Chico, he, he, he said, there's something God impressed upon his heart that he was never going to leave under duress. He was never going to leave because he felt like some external pressure forcing him out. And I, and I just thought, wow, that's great. I mean, like, that is a word of wisdom right there. So whether that's in a ministry context or in a relationship context, in a marriage context, in a work context, don't leave under duress. Don't leave because there's some kind of external fear or pressure or you trying to act as your own savior. We never make good decisions. We never make godly decisions in that kind of context. And generally it leads to a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and a lot of destruction. So don't move under duress. Don't be driven by fear. That's, that's Satan. Satan beats the sheep. <laughs> Satan tries to drive this, the sheep with a whip of fear. But instead, we need to be led by the good shepherd. We need to be following after Jesus. And that is most certainly going to require us to trust him, to have faith. Amen? So, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not run. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The word there, conceive, is genao. It's where we get our word genealogy from. And it describes the commencement of life where previously none had existed. Now, while Jesus had existed eternally, Jesus was with the Father, with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There was this triune God that has existed for all eternity. And yet this conception would mark the commencement of his existence as a man. Jesus took on an additional nature as a man. This is what the Bible teaches. This is the doctrine of the incarnation. Incarnation is a word that comes from Latin, incarno, which literally means in the flesh. God incarnate, God in the flesh. Again, Jesus who existed eternally as God, one in existence with the Father and the Holy Spirit in eternity, took on this additional human nature and entered into our world. This is what is taking place here. And John speaks of this. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then to 14. Follow with me. This is so important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh, incarnate, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus coming in the flesh. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, so essential. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to be held on to, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is marvelous. This is amazing. This is so powerful. We could spend so much time just in these two verses here these two sections of John and Philippians. But I, I mentioned them just to say, this is what the Bible teaches. Jesus was God and he became a man. It's conceived in the womb of Mary. And the angel says that you will, the, 
that, uh, excuse me, verse 21, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The reason he's going to be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, we talked a little bit about the name of Jesus last week in our last study, but I do want to just remind us again because it's so essential. Jesus was given his name by God, by God the Father. And that name in Hebrew is Yeshua or Joshua, which means Yahweh saves, God saves. So the name Jesus literally means God saves. Acts 4.12 speaks so beautifully of this. Now there is salvation, excuse me, nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus. That is a very exclusive statement, I know. Jesus makes it of himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does it, how does it finish? And? And no one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. Those are the terms. We can't just come to God any way we want to. God is God. He's the creator. It's very arrogant of us to say, well, you know, I kind of don't like the way you are, so I'm just going to, you know, make up my own way. <laughs> and, and I'm sure it's going to work out. It, it won't. We can't dictate to God the terms of salvation. We can't create our own reality or our own truth. There is one truth, and that's God's truth. And Jesus said, thy word is truth. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. That's John 17, 17, by the way. God has made a way for us to be saved, and that is through his son, Jesus. He will save his people from what? From sin, right? The name of Jesus will define his mission. Real quickly, what is sin? It's not a word that is used again very often in our uh, you know, language, in our society. What is sin? Well, it's not just a mistake or an oversight or I messed up. Those are usually the words that we, we use to kind of soften the blow of the word sin. And sin, essentially, is an archery term that means to miss the mark. The idea is somebody is aiming for the center of that mark, that target. They fire that arrow, and it misses. So that is one way to think of sin, missing the mark. You know, we try to be a good person, but we fail. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But sin is, is more than that. Sin is a departure from God. Sin is a rebellion against God. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And the nature of sin is this. You, you cannot sin unless you break the first commandment. In order for me to sin, guess what I need to do? I need to create some other God, some other thing that I am serving, that I am worshiping, that I am beholden to, some other thing that has mastery over me. Jesus said, he who commits sin is a slave to sin. But he has come to set slaves free. Right? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free, Jesus says. I've come to bring liberation and to bring freedom from sin. And all of us, the human nature is this, that we have a little idol-making factory in our heart, you could say. And there's things that we bow down to. There's good things that God has given us. Good things. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he looked out and he said, this is good, this is good, this is good. It was good. But we take something that is good and we make it 
ultimate. We make it the thing that we're living for. And thus what happens is we become slaves to that thing. And now we are mastered by something. We become slaves. And guess what idolatry does? Not only makes slaves out of us, but it makes slaves of other people. People then become a means to our own end. We want to have pleasure and, and have a good time. And if that comes at the expense of somebody else, well, that's life. That's just the world, right? You see, that is what sin does. That's why sin is so bad. Sin isn't just bad because God says, no, don't do it. Sin is bad because it is a rebellion against the fabric of the nature of the universe. <laughs> Sin is a rebellion against the way that God has made things. You know, think of it like gravity, you know. Sin is thinking you can jump off of a building and not have consequences. That's bad. It's not going to be good for you. And God knows that. Because God has structured the universe in such a way that the person who sins in the end is going to die. The wages of sin, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin, what you earn when you sin is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Death is not just a cessation of physical life, according to the Bible, but it is a separation from God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they began to die physically. Death entered into the created order, but more importantly, more significantly, they were separated from God, from that fellowship that they had with them, and therefore death entered into the world. And so Jesus has come to, to save us from that, to save us from the, the separation between us and God. And ultimately, he has come to defeat death. He rose from the grave and therefore defeated death. And the promise is that all who believe in him will have everlasting life, not just communion with God, but actually physically resurrected eternal life with God. We talked a lot about that in our last study of the book of Revelation. This is the promise of the gospel. And Jesus accomplished this by his death and resurrection. To him, Revelation 1 verse 5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, when he died upon that cross, all the punishment for my sin and for your sin went on Jesus. He took the penalty. He died the death that we deserved. And in a marvelous and miraculous way, paid the debt of our sin. This is the gospel. And he proved that it was good. He proved that his death was sufficient because he rose up from the grave three days later. So Jesus will save his people from their sins. And that is through the gospel. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, I want to just quickly note, it says, and he will save his people from their sins. When it talks about his people, it's speaking of the Jewish people. Of course, the gospel is to the Jew first and then for the Gentile, according to Romans 1.16. But of course, in Christ, that dividing wall between Jew and Gentile is brought down and he creates in himself one new people, the people of God. Uh, again, I don't want to blow you away too much, um, but for, for those of you who are kind of familiar with the Bible and the scriptures, just wanted to um, put that out there. You can check it out for yourself, Ephesians 2, 11 through 15. So that's what it means when it talks about his people, saving his people from their sins. Now, um, furthermore, notice verse 22. This is really important. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. And that word fulfilled is exceedingly important in the book of Matthew. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God 
with us. So Matthew points out the prophetic significance of the virgin birth. See, this birth, this miraculous event, wasn't just something that kind of happened to get people's attention. It was actually promised hundreds of years before the Messiah came by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah says, you're going to know the Messiah has come when a virgin conceives. And, and Matthew wants to connect the dots for his readers. That word fulfilled, he'll use that word over and over and over again. And I've listed all the references where Matthew uses that in relationship to prophecy being fulfilled by Jesus. This is all part of God's plan. And this is all part of uh, God's way of identifying who the Messiah is. You're going to know who the Messiah is by this sign. The virgin is going to conceive. Now, I also want us to point out some, uh, to take note of something here. It says, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. It was spoken by God, by the Lord, through the prophet. The words that are spoken, the words that are given here in the scripture are God's words. This is, the Bible claims to be the word of God. 2 Peter 1.21 says, prophecy never came by the will of man. Somebody didn't just like think, oh, this would be interesting to write down. <laughs> or like Nostradamus or something like that. But prophecy didn't come by somebody's kind of crazy idea. No, it, it came when holy men were moved by the Holy Spirit. God moved them. God breathed his word through them. God used a human instrument to record his word. It's so important that we take note of that. Why? Why is it important? Because if the Bible is just man's word, well, then I can just pick and choose what I like and what I don't like. You know, you read something, you read a book, you read a, a self-help book, and, and you go, you know, I really like number five on the 10 steps to success, but number three, uh, not for me. Yeah, that's fine. You can do that. You can live your life how you want, right? You have freedom when it's somebody else's opinion. But when it's God's word, you can't just pick and choose. You can't just pull the Sharpie out and say, yeah, I don't really like this, this thing right here. So I'm going to just cross it out. But this other stuff, yeah, I'll pick and choose. Again, that, that goes back to try to, you know, make God in our image. To try to bring God to us on our terms. It doesn't work that way. You can't put yourself in the place of God and say, dictate to him, well, these are my terms and you can take them or leave them. No, mm-mm. He is the creator. He's the, he's the boss. He's the one in charge. And we can either submit to that, yield our lives to him, and, and like Mary, say, hey, Lord, I'm yours. Take my life and use it however you will. Or we can rebel, and we can try to do our own thing. And God is a gentleman. <laughs> He's not going to force his way upon you. But he has revealed himself through his word, and ultimately through his son, Jesus. And that's what it says here. It's spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Absolutely essential. So again, Matthew connects the events in Mary and Joseph's life to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. And notice again, the virgin, verse 23, shall be with child, bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. We're going to close with this. Final thought, that Jesus is Emmanuel. What a beautiful, incredible name for Jesus. It means God with us. A few things I want to point out to you. Number one, this again shows the deity of Jesus. He is God in the flesh, God with us. Number two, it shows that God has pursued us. Every other world religion is man's attempt at reaching God. 
trying to, you know, follow these certain set of rules in order to please God and hopefully win his favor. Not so with Christianity. Christianity says there's no way you could ever be good enough. Perfection is, is what is God's standard, holy perfection. And therefore, we all fall short of that. But God has done something incredible. He has sent his one and only son, Jesus, that whosoever believes, it's not about your works, it's not about what you can do or how you can earn God's favor. It's, we're simply called to believe. A child can do it. Yes, it's that simple. To believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can save you from your sin because of his death and resurrection upon the cross. And all who believe in him shall not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. You will not ultimately suffer the consequences of sin. Jesus has reversed the curse and will bring you into perfect fellowship with God in a resurrected, glorified body. That is the gospel. So, Emmanuel shows us that God has sought us out and pursued us and made a way for our salvation. It's not something that a man came up with. And number three, that God is faithful and will never leave us. God is not a fair-weather friend. He is always with us. I love Matthew 28. This is a very special verse to me because I was in a very dark place. I was in Nigeria. I had been struck in the forehead by a metal fan. <laughs> It actually was pretty serious. It opened up my head real, real big. And uh, I could have bled to death. I could have been blinded. I could have been killed. It was a metal-bladed fan. Long story. <laughs> Don't have time to get into it. But, you know, I, I was able to get, get it stitched up and everything. My eyes swelled shut. This was like the second day in the country. I was going to be there two weeks. And I remember laying on the floor, there was a fan, another fan, <laughs> that was on above me and it was kind of keeping me cool, it's really hot. And then the power went out, <laughs> you know, and then the flies were coming and I still hadn't had a, a bath or a shower. Um, so there was all this blood caked in my hair and I was in a bad way. I was hurting, I was wondering what, how did I get here? Ever had a question, you know, ever come to that realization? How did I get here? <laughs> this isn't what I signed up for. And there I am. And I, I got up and I was able to see with one eye, I looked at myself in the mirror and I, do you ever see those Rocky movies, you know? <laughs> Just like my eyes were swelled shut. And I was like, oh man, this is crazy. And I just said, Lord, I really need to hear from you really need to hear from you right now because this is scary. And these words came to my mind. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you. Hebrews says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Emmanuel means God is never, ever, ever going to give up on you. He's never going to forsake you. The one who has been born again, the one who has trusted in Christ, he says, I will not forsake you. <sighs> Emmanuel is not some quality given to enable us to endure a trial. It is not a dramatic change of circumstances that makes victory possible, but it is the unfailing presence of a person of Jesus, our Emmanuel. 
The name Emmanuel emphasizes the nearness of God. Christ's birth brought the infinite holy God within reach of finite sinful man. I love this. God came to live with us so we could live with him. The son of God became the son of man that he might change the sons of men into the sons of God. Sons and daughters who can say, now draw near with confidence to the throne of grace through our Emmanuel. Amen. I got that from preceptaustin.org. I highly recommend checking that resource out. Final quote here from J.C. Ryle. He writes this about Emmanuel. He promises to be with us daily to pardon and forgive, with us daily to sanctify and strengthen, with us daily to defend and keep, with us daily to lead and to guide, with us in sorrow and with us in joy, with us in sickness and with us in health, with us in life and with us in death, with us in time and with us in eternity. Amen? Let's all stand together. Worship team, you guys can come up. Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Emmanuel. We thank you that because of the humility of Christ, he came and took on that form of, of a man, became a baby, <laughs> born to an unwed mother in a barn, no less, and, and lived a a life of love and of service, a perfect life, and yet was crucified. A horrible, torturous death for us. We thank you for Jesus. And right now I want to give an opportunity for anyone who is here, who you are far from God, and you realize that you need help, you realize that you need a Savior. Christ is here. Emmanuel, he said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. He's with us right now. And his arms are open wide to anyone, to all who would come. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's his promise. He'll take your burden and replace it with his yoke, which is easy and light, with his joy, with his love and peace, with forgiveness. But you got to call on him. <clears throat> you got to believe in him. So is there anyone here tonight who says, that's me. I need to draw near to God. I believe that Jesus died for my sin and that he rose again. And I want to draw near to him. And you can raise your hand to simply acknowledge that. The raising of the hand does not save you, and it's not anything that I necessarily need to see, but it helps me to, you know, see who, who is there who wants to draw near and to pray for you. So is there anyone, anyone here tonight? Simply call upon the name of the Lord, be saved. Just raise your hand to say, yeah, that's me. Oh, Father, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your grace. And I pray, Lord, you just continue to reveal yourself to each person here as only you can. To show us that, God, you've given us your son, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Pray you bless and strengthen your people. Help us to walk with you. Help us to trust you through it all. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen, amen. amen. Let's worship together.